Okay, I'd like to welcome Brandon Laws to the show today. Uh, Brandon is actually the senior director of marketing. That senior part is really important. Uh, it's for so the- important. PR. It's so important. Uh, Don't so forget for- that. <laughs> for, for the viewers at home, Brandon and I have known each other for a really, really long time. Uh, mm-hmm. I originally got him into uh, into authors like Tony Robbins and Napoleon Hill, and uh, you know, got him uh, turned him into an econ dork just like me. <laughs> Uh, but yes. what Brandon and I are here to talk about is the uh, the dynamics of COVID for both job seekers and employers, because it's really kind of thrown everybody's life into a big tornado. Sure. And uh, I think a lot of people are kind of grasping, trying to figure out what to do. Uh, so Brandon, kind of uh, take it away. Well, I appreciate having me on. I'm glad to be on your, your podcast. I um, I've been working in the HR space for 12 years now uh, in a marketing role. Has but it been I- that long? It's been well, October's 12 years. Yeah, I started in 2008 when when everything was kind of hitting the fan uh, with the Great Recession. And so I... Everything hit the fan. Yeah. Right, right. And then, and then it's happening again. And I'm sort of seeing this play out in more of a senior role. Like I'm looking at it from uh, what's important to employers right now and what's important to employees. Yeah. And we're trying to kind of bridge that gap because it's really chaotic. Employers are scared. Employees don't know if they're going to have jobs. It's... It's an interesting time right now, to say the least. Well, I mean, yeah, let's start from the employer perspective because, yeah. you know, because of course, right, you know, the, I think a lot of people who are listening will be, will be employees, but I don't know, a lot of people listening will be senior decision makers also. So, to, you know, from an employer perspective, what are, what are a lot of people seeing? Kind of what are the, what's going on? What are, their, what are the dynamics? Because, of course, it all flows downhill because if employers can't make it, then that means you have less employment, which we've seen. Right. And, you know, we're actually have to figure out how are we going to go back to getting all these people who are sitting on the sidelines to be able to do something productive. Yeah, I think there's a, the challenge for employers right now is that there's so much uncertainty. I think yeah. when, when COVID hit, um, gosh, it's been what Mar- mid-March, most yeah. employers made the decision to switch remote uh, if they could. And then others, you know, might not have that opportunity to go remote. So they're still like trying to make it safe. So there's just so many weird dynamics that are playing out. So if you're shifting to remote, now all of a sudden you need to have the IT staff to be able to support yeah. remote work. Well, then that brings up a whole different can of worms with leadership, right? Like how do you lead people from remote, make sure they're productive and doing what they're supposed to be doing and not like doing the dishes. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's so easy at home. There's so many distractions. So I think leading people, um, the uncertainty of will we be able to go back to the office as we as we know it? Will it be forever changed? Uh, will our expenses be? Uh, we're are going to be we basically going to be paying not only for remote work, but are, are we going to be paying for an empty office? Like, there's just so many things playing out, and then you have this whole legal component too. Exactly. And I think that's where employers are really confused is states are getting involved. Uh, we're in Oregon and it's pretty locked down. I mean, our kids aren't even in school. Um, at one point, and that's just you know, amazing. A, that's been amazing. And that, that's a whole nother dynamic too. It's like, okay, I'm, I'm working, but yet then you have kids to worry about and you're trying to do homeschooling, <laughs> right? So I think for on the employer side, there's so much to think about. I mean, they just want to keep their doors open and stay profitable. Exactly. And, and, and the employees are worried as well. They, they want to make sure they have a job to come to. And yeah, it's just, there's a lot playing out right now. And I mean, it's, and I, I just keep thinking, you know, just the level of anxiety that everybody's carrying around, you know, cause I, I know that you know, every now and then somebody I, I know will, will say or do something just really outlandish. And as much as possible, I try not to react because I'm like, okay, just for the amount of anxiety that's in everybody's heads, right. you figure at least once or twice per month, you're going to lash out in some completely irrational way for something that is not meaningful at all. And that's really just normal for the amount of just uncertainty and anxiety that's swirling around. Yeah. And no, I'm glad you brought that up too, because I think one thing that employers, if they're not already worried about, but they will worry about long-term is the health of their, their people. So yeah. you need a happy and healthy workforce in order to be productive, to make profit. It all goes downstream. But now you have this weird dynamic where you're stuck in your house uh-huh. um, 
and there's nothing to really look forward to. And so the mental health of your people is something to worry about. So I think you're going to see a lot kind of play out in the next six months to a yeah. year about employers getting really involved in the mental health of their people. So, yeah. well, I, I mean, I think that's, uh, you know, I, I know this, you and I have had this conversation before, yeah. but I think that's actually something that's uh, really long overdue and coming is that, you know, there's, there's kind of been this mindset that, okay, you know, your work's your work and your life's your life and the two don't have anything to do with one another. Those days are gone, my friend. Yeah. Those days are gone. And so I think that you know, if you're going to, yeah, if you're going to have a, a productive workforce, that's able to you know, get things done at even a reasonable level, you're going to have to really start looking after people's, you know, what, you know, the larger context of their lives. Otherwise they're just going to, their mental health is just going to start going downhill. And right. I go, yeah, you know, you might get them to send some emails or, you know, log into a couple of meetings, but you're not going to get their best. No, you're not. Well, and, and that, the, the other thing I always think about when it comes to the workplaces is if you have a good culture and, and, and great team engagement, Yeah. I mean, the more you work on that, the happier your people are going to be. They have kind of friends at work, they're more productive, they have good communication. Well, now you go remote and those team dynamics are sort of split in half. Yeah. And so I worry about that too, is like, how do you create engagement in the workplace? It's, it's challenging right now. Yeah, no, totally. Totally. All right. Well, Hey, let's, let's flip the script and talk, yeah. talk about this from an employee employee perspective. Cause you know, a lot of the employees are probably just utterly terrified that, that they're, that they're going to lose their jobs. And for good reason in a lot of cases, yeah. You know, because it's like you, know, you, you, you know, even if you're a senior person, even if you have a quote guaranteed, uh, guaranteed job, I I can guarantee you that if your company, municipality, whatever, you lose money for long enough, there's <laughs> nobody's jobs are guaranteed. I don't care what the union contract says. Yeah, I think there's a lot of anxiety around employees right now because I think they're having conversations with either their managers or even maybe senior leaders are coming out and saying, hey, look, here's where we're at from a financial standpoint. And I think nowadays employers have to be transparent about that stuff yeah. to, to gain trust for their people. But I, um, I think there's a lot of anxiety for that reason. They know in six months if things aren't changing if there's no demand for whatever widget we're creating or whatever service we're providing that there's going to be tough decisions to be made in, in, in that amount of time. And I think we have this nice buffer, um, from the federal government, you know, with the cares act back, uh, and that, but that stuff has expired. Yeah. You know, I think in Oregon, we might have a little, uh, buffer with the, I want to say it's like 300 a week in addition to yeah. the unemployment that's not enough to live on. And no, so, I, no, I, so I think if people are like, Oh, my job's on the line, what's, what's their safety net at this point? Yeah. So, well, and, yeah, I think I, I saw an article that was actually was really disturbing. I think it was something on the, on the lines of uh, three out of 10 households had burned through all their savings during COVID. Wow. And yeah, that's, that I mean, and of course, that's going to be principally, yeah, that, that's principally going to be weighted on your, you know, your lower end of your socio demographic scale, who, who right. are households that don't tend to have a lot of savings in the first place. But still, that's a lot. That's that's, that's a lot. That's a and lot. where's the recovery for them? Yeah. You, like we employees, there, there's just the future so much more uncertain. I think for employees than it is for employers. Yeah. It's like, when is life going to get back to normal? We talked about kids, like you're trying to balance those two things. I, I just, I, I, I want to know how all this plays out. <laughs> well, and especially because it's like, you know, and I think what about somebody who's trying to start a career? Like I remember, you know, you, you, you dropped into your career, career right at the beginning of the great recession. Yeah. And, but like, what about somebody who's coming out of college? They'd be like, okay, well, so am I going to be able to find a grown up job? Am I going to be able to do grow? Am I going to be able to start doing adulting kind of stuff? Like, you know, paying rent, uh, owning a house, you know, I, I you know, I, I would, kind of stuff. I would, I would say, and most people wouldn't have this opinion, but I'd say coming into the workforce at, at a recessionary period is good learning experience. I mean, most people, if they're hopefully, if they took care of their finances, they wouldn't have a ton of burden. Like there's no, yeah. not a lot of debts besides school loans, which you could probably defer those or something, but there's not a lot of expenses. People come out of school with loans. What? <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> I, I thankfully I didn't. So like when I came into the workplace or the workforce at, in 2008, 
I was sort of like naive. I didn't know really, I knew what was happening, but I wasn't like worried about for my job all the time. But you take a seasoned person, 15 yeah. years on the job or something, they got a family, they got a mortgage, they got car payments. You, you throw them some anxiety their way for oh, sure. sure. And yeah, when you, you, well, that's it. You start getting people who depend on you. Cause yeah, I think I, I had the same story as you, but I came in, to the, to the workforce in 2001 yeah, right when the tech wreck was happening <laughs> and I was in the technology industry. So right in the middle of the tech wreck. Yeah. That's an incredible time. And you were working for a tech firm at that, that point too. It's just everything was <laughs> it's insane. Yeah. We're, and we're seeing all that play out now. So I, yeah, I think, you know, just the, the employment dynamics, I think you're going to see employers really take a, a leading role. They're going to get out in front and, and be yeah. transparent with their people. I think if they're a good employer, they would do that. Even if it makes them a little anxious, I think it's better than people making up stories in their head. Because I think what happens is if the employer's not out front saying, here's where our finances are, here's what our employment status is as far as our hiring or wage freezes yeah. or anything like that. If they're not talking about that, employees will start making up stories in their head and oh, then they'll start talking with each other. And now due to social media, they can talk virtually <laughs> and it's just this whole can of worms. So I, I would encourage employers who are listening just to be upfront with your people. They're adults. They can, they can handle it. And if they can't, then, yeah, then totally. take, take well, it up individually. It's just, uh, just thinking that uh, your conversation made me think of a um, talk I was having with a friend of mine who was a recruiter a couple of weeks ago where uh, she was talking with a, um, you know, she was talking with an employer about a role they were opening. And so she asked one of her normal questions. She goes, okay, why would somebody want to come work for you? And they go, oh wait, is that still a thing? <laughs> <laughs> really? I'm like, wow. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, that's one way to go with it. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 that, that part, the interviewing and just the dynamics of like, why would somebody want to come work for you in the culture? Like there's just, there's so much um, that's new to, to people. I think yeah. uh, on the interviewing side, on the recruiting side, like I don't even know how you do these, uh, these video interviews. And I mean, it's just the questions you're asking are a lot different now. Well, so. And the, the, the video interviewing, it's so weird too, because a lot of times what you'll do is you'll get a link and you'll have to record a response, like a two to three minute response yeah. with nobody on the other end. And so you have no clue at all whether what you're saying is resonating in any way. <laughs> you can't read the room. You can't kind of have any back and forth. You just basically have to do a straight monologue really? and hope that what you're saying kind of you know, touches something that's, uh, that's important. So they'll ask a question and then you'll record a response. Yep. And it goes yep. out into, do you see the other people or nope. like whoever's nope. interviewing you? No, you, you, a lot of times, yeah, you, what, what you'll do is, uh, and uh, you'll see the person, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll see the, a person's face that pops up and asks a question, Yeah. but then you just have to record a response and usually you have two or three shots and then that's it. You, <laughs> you send it off. That is, I, I would hope to God that most employers are not doing that type of interview. <laughs> I mean, this kind of interview, I mean, this is where you catch the nuances of well, sure. behavior. And if, if somebody's scripting a response like that, I just don't know if you're going to get the best out of people and figure out if they're a good fit or not. Exactly. Exactly. That's bizarre. <laughs> that's, that's it sounds like you've, you've gone through this before. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, and cause yeah, I've, uh, you know, I've experienced it and my wife's experienced it. And so it's just such a weird experience. Yeah. Yeah, I think like, do you, I'm going to, I know you're interviewing me, but I, I like this, <laughs> no, the fact ahead. that we're having a discussion. Do you um, anticipate things being just completely different going forward? Meaning like, yeah, this is a period of time where we're in COVID and we're doing a lot of virtual stuff, but yeah. do you think it's forever changed? Like we do meetings this way now. We're not like going to go fly to Texas to, to do a meeting. We're going to do it via Zoom with a, a group of people. Yeah, well, I think that, you know, if, uh, you know, if, if I were the one who was putting a team together in kind of the post-COVID environment, so like, you know, let's, uh, you know, let's say, I think that uh, a, uh, a mail that went out for my kid's school said that they were going to be working, that they were going to be in remote school until at least the middle of November. So let's just assume right. that something happens in November that makes everybody okay with everything and they decide the world can go back to no. The election? <laughs> I, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to go there, but let's just assume <laughs> something in November happens and then people decide that everything is okay now. Well, so, you know, if I was going to be figuring out what I think a team interaction uh, would look like, I'd say, okay, well, I think that forcing everybody to come to the same 
location every day is kind of silly. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, I think that you miss something if you have everybody in Zoom all the time. Right. So the way, the way that I would want to do it would be to say, okay, let's just basically go virtual two to three weeks out of the month and then get everybody together one week out of the month. Because you know, if you plan what you're doing, concentrate your time and get everybody in one room for a small amount of time and right. then have everybody go back and break, you can still get the collaboration. You can still build and right. relationships, but you're not forcing people to sit in 45 minutes of traffic each way every day. So I love that approach because, and I think you and I had an, uh, an exchange on LinkedIn. Remember Cal Newport's book, Deep Work. Yep. It's yep. to me, you do that type of setup at work where you might have in-person meetings a week out of the month and yeah. you know, this can be a little bit of lost productivity because of just the, the banter and the normal niceties and, and sure. all that stuff. You're just going to naturally lose that. But the social dynamic of the team, you're more cohesive, you work just the nuance of speech. It just is better in person. Yeah. And then when you go back to remote work, people could be hyper-focused. They know what their roles and responsibilities nice. are and, and they can still communicate effectively remotely. I think the companies that figure that out will win in the yeah, end. Precisely. Well, and, and also because you, know, you were talking about uh, you know, how do you make sure somebody's actually working. I think that a lot of people underestimate how much real work gets done in an eight hour period. Uh, so you, know, you could have somebody who's at the office for eight hours in all likelihood, you're probably not getting more than about three, maybe hours. four hours of really, really productive work. And so if you can amp that up to six and they still get a couple of hours for mental health, uh, that's still a 50% increase in net real productivity. You know, I think a lot of people need to get out of the, uh, the, the clock hours mentality and get into oh, the, yeah. how much real productive work is being done because it's usually not nearly as much as people think. And I think if... if people leading these companies were really good people leaders. They would really understand that it's about results and not butt in the seat. And yeah. this is the, the zoom stuff and the remote work has really forced us to think that way. It's like, you know what? I don't really care how much they're logging in and what their time card says or whatever. It's, it's about what are they producing for me? Yeah. What are, are, are we seeing the results? Yeah. So yeah, that's I think you're starting to see a shift. Number one, you get paid yeah. for results, not effort. That's but you would be so surprised, like how many managers and leaders micromanage the, the time part of it. And it's bizarre to me. Well, it, like, it's because time feels more, especially if anything where you have a long funnel. Yeah. yeah, it's it, you know, time feels like something you can control or something that's that's kind of that's influenceable. Whereas you're saying, right. okay, you know, I want to manage somebody closing an account that has a <laughs> six month sales cycle you know, that's, that's really hard to manage on a day-to-day -day basis. That is true. Yeah. That's a really good point. <laughs> well, all right. So, Hey, Hey Brandon, let's, uh, uh, let's wrap it up for people or, uh, or, or maybe, I don't know, maybe we'll go off on another tangent, but, uh, um, what's, uh, what, what can people do? How can they improve their situation? I think for the, the situation right now, especially and going forward, this is always going to be a problem. Like you need to develop good communication tactics with your people. Yeah. Uh, leaders need to, um, they need to have trust in each other. So, you know, there's, there's things that are really good about like doing little breakouts with, with uh, leaders to gain trust and to get to know each other at a deeper level, uh, build empathy for each other. Because then when you're running a company and you're, and you're communicating with your contributor level employees, all of that runs through. It's like a, it's a very systemic situation. So I'd say have a lot of opportunity to, to talk at a deep level with your leaders, your employees, be transparent. I mean, all of those things are communication based. I think that's, what's going to help long-term with yeah, for, for employees, employers, and everybody. Absolutely. Alike. Well, and uh, you know, if somebody's on the employee side, what do you think they can do to really make a difference? They need the opportunity. I think, I mean, it starts with leaders, like I said, but like, I think employees, they need those opportunities to, to have open conversations with their managers about what they can do to contribute at a high level. Yeah. Um, and without those opportunities, employees don't really have a lot of control, but, um, you know, I think, um, you know, if I, if I can impose my will on an employee, I'd say read, read as much as you possibly can. Right. Um, 
work as hard as you possibly can, take on more projects than you normally would say yes to just about everything. And, and that way you're kind of irreplaceable. You're that linchpin inside of the organization yeah. where you're, you're, you're not going to be replaced. You, you won't be the first to go because you're producing the results. Yeah. So if employees are listening, that's what I would say is you're not doing anything at home right now. You might be, you might be homeschooling your kids. I mean, I, I am in between work, but I'm here to, I'm here to produce results. Yeah. I'm, I'm here. Absolutely. Nothing else going on. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Hey, appreciate you taking the time, Brandon. And, uh, yeah. appreciate, uh, appreciate you listening. Yeah, up after that conversation with Brandon, one of the things that really stuck out to me as we were ending the conversation is the importance of leadership in a time like COVID. Uh, I think it's really easy if you're in charge of an organization to kind of just sort of hope that things get better or hope that things go back to normal. Uh, but in a lot of cases, you have to make a lot of really tough decisions. And, and a lot of times that's what leadership is about. Uh, and it, it can be especially tough decisions when you have to decide, okay, when do you have to let people go? Who do you let go? How do you do that? Uh, and these are the types of decisions where we really need leaders to step up to the plate. Uh, and actually, one of the things that I do, my, my business is to help leaders with that. The way that I help is through helping them optimize their costs. So my business is with a company, company called Expense Reduction Analysts, and I am a cost optimization consultant. And so I work on a success fee basis, which means that my clients don't pay anything unless I can find them savings. So that means the worst case situation will be that I will come into your business or nonprofit, do an assessment and say that you are getting the best in class cost purchasing process, everything across the board. The reason why I say that's the worst case is because if that's the case, then I can't help make your P&L any better. Uh, but that's still not bad because if that situation happens, then I won't invoice you for anything. So I would love to talk with you about how I can come and help find the savings that can be used to invest in growth or to acquire key skill sets or to avoid layoffs. Uh, so please schedule some time with me. Uh, go to www.meetdug.biz. That is meetdug.biz. That will take you to my Calendly link and you'll have a chance to put some time on my calendar. Uh, or alternatively, if there's a topic you'd really like to talk about on this podcast, uh, go to that same link, that's www.meetdug.biz, and let's do a podcast interview. Uh, the purpose of this podcast is to bring ideas to people that are flown over by the mainstream media. Uh, there is so much complexity and there is just so much flavor to life that just doesn't get reflected in the corporate media that I really want to bring that to people. And I I would love for you to be a part of helping me do that. Uh, thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to talking again. Thank you for listening to the Terminal Value Podcast. Share it with your friends by sending them to TerminalValuePodcast.com. For more information, please visit BusinessOfLifeLLC.com for full access to Doug's products and services. All rights reserved. No part of this broadcast may be produced in any form by any means without written permission from Business of Life, LLC. All trademarks and brands referred to herein are the property of their respective owners.